The annual award of the Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz Prize by the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft is always noted by the public with considerable interest. This renowned promotion prize, the most highly endowed one in Germany, honors scientists who have demonstrated excellence in their respective fields. The prize, which as a rule is three million Deutschmarks, is aimed at improving their working conditions and broadening their research options. For a period of five years, they can plan their projects, employ young scientists, and are free of administrative work. This program has been a firm element of the DFG's repertoire since 1985. Founded in 1920 as the Emergency Association of German Science, the DFG is Germany's largest research-promoting organization and therefore forms the most important pillar of basic research. In the annual assembly marking the beginning of the new century that was held in Bremen Town Hall, the DFG's president, Professor Ernst Ludwig Winnacker, formulated its mission. What is the DFG? The DFG is the central self-governing organization of German science. Every scientist with a doctor's degree can apply to the DFG for research support, and its trademark is the quality of promotion it offers, which makes its work a national and international gold standard. More than 90 billion Deutschmarks are spent on research and development in Germany every year. Two-thirds of this sum is provided by German industry. The rest is supplied by the public budgets of the federal and lender governments. The DFG currently receives more than 2 billion Deutschmarks per year as a joint federal and lender grant. Compared to the total volume, this is a small but significant contribution to the promotion of excellent research projects at universities. Out of this sum, the DFG allocates a quarter each to the promotion of projects in engineering and the natural sciences, while the arts receive just under a fifth and around a third goes to the biosciences. The collaborative research centres, of which there are currently almost 300, are the DFG's most important instrument in supporting new structures and cooperation at the universities. In Jena, for example, an international team of scientists from various disciplines and headed by the young biochemist Anna Ulrich are working at a collaborative research centre in the exciting and forward-looking area of membrane biochemistry. Their pet is the sea urchin. The sea urchin is a popular pet among fertilization researchers. For almost 100 years it has been possible to observe the sperm and egg cells with the microscope, and thus we know a lot about the relevant molecules. And for us, the sea urchin proteins we're looking at here provide a model of fusion systems that could also find analogies in human beings. Nowadays, the Jena researchers do not have to cull any sea urchins. They simply breed the proteins they need in bacteria cultures. How do the cells of an organism manage to isolate themselves from the outside on the one hand and let certain substances enter them on the other? In sea urchin fertilization, it is a protein called bindine that plays a key role in cell fusion. We are particularly interested in a fertilizing protein that starts membrane fusion between the sperm and the egg cell, because we hope to deduce from this model protein how other fusion processes take place in the body. For example, if a virus penetrates a cell, or if one wishes to smuggle DNA or active agents into a cell for gene therapy, this can all be accomplished via a fusion process between the lipid membranes. The pharmaceutical industry has shown considerable interest in the results of such basic research. This may still be pie in the sky, but once the fusion processes are fully explained, it might be possible to channel active agents or genes into cells to inhibit the penetration of pathogenic viruses. 
Once we have gained a better understanding of the fundamental mechanisms of membrane fusion, it is conceivable that medicine will be developed on this basis. For example, we can imagine interrupting fertilization by blocking fusion between the sperm and the egg cell, or stopping membrane fusion could prevent a virus entering a host cell. And once we are capable of triggering a desired membrane fusion, it is conceivable that it will then be possible to channel, for example, medicaments or pieces of DNA into a cell by wrapping them in lipid and then letting the fusion process commence. Anna Ulrich and her team can make use of a highly sophisticated apparatus for their experiments, a solid-state NMR spectrometer. There are a few other examples of this type of apparatus in biological research in Germany. Its unique technical equipment is one of the assets that make the Jena Institute for Molecular Biology especially attractive to young researchers from abroad. English has become the everyday language. The quantity of but there is another aspect that Anna Ulrich particularly appreciates at the Jena location. We are able to design our own research projects and manage our finance ourselves. And I believe that kind of freedom is still rare in the traditional hierarchical German university system. Although the DFG's main emphasis is on basic research, it also makes attempts to intensify transfer between research, development and industrial application, especially in the engineering sciences. One example is a project from the priority program Autonomous Walking at Munich Technical University. This is Max, a computer-controlled six-legged walking robot. It's no coincidence that he looks like a huge insect. The Munich scientists have copied his construction principles from the stick insect. They enviously admit that nature is more perfect than their somewhat clumsy walking machine. Years of work have been put into designing the robot and implementing the concept. In a way, the two first dissertations put the system into practice. With the blueprints, the entire electronics, the respective casting systems, workshop activities with three to four staff in the range of one and a half years. This means an additional five staff a year. So in order to implement a concept of this kind, and certainly for this special machine, it takes 14 to 15 man years. Max's eight-legged brother is called Moritz, and he weighs 21 kilos. He can move both horizontally and vertically in pipes, regardless of their gradient. This is a robust prototype that can be employed wherever humans cannot go, or will only make very slow progress, such as in repairing sewage systems in the mineral oil industry, in chemical or nuclear plants, or in fires in tunnels. Since he uses legs to walk, just like a living organism, he can work much better than wheel-driven systems. So far, two-legged Johnny has only been learning to walk as a computer model. Yes, we hope to get him to walk at around 7.2 kilometers an hour. That would be fast jogging. Of course, the primary goals are of a basic research nature. However, the results that are gained can then be implemented in practice, for example, in the area of prosthetics, where the aim is to support people with robot systems, in the field of household assistance, or with other robots that will probably play a role in our day-to-day -day lives in future. The DFG's activities are organized and coordinated by more than 600 staff at its head offices in Bonn. Each year, around 10,000 new research projects in all areas of science are promoted in various procedures. The best projects compete with each other in order to raise the efficiency of German research. This is also where the applications are handed in to be examined, as regards their academic quality and originality, a task that is carried out with considerable care. After all, the money the DFG manages and distributes autonomously does come from taxpayers. Competent program directors are the first an application for a grant is submitted to. 
Incidentally, the corresponding leaflets can be requested via the Internet. Around 20,000 applications are handed in each year. The best ones have to be chosen from them. Ultimately, less than half of the applicants are given the go-ahead. The program directors are responsible for selecting the reviewers who prepare the recommendations for a decision. The reviewers, who are elected by all active researchers every four years, work in an honorary capacity. As a rule, two reviewers are elected for each subject, while there may be up to ten in large fields involving intensive research. They bear the main responsibility for selecting the best projects. On the basis of their recommendations, the DFG's Grants Committee ultimately has the final say on the promotion of research projects. Depending on the outcome of assessments, applications are either accepted or turned down by this body of the DFG, in which scientists and representatives of the federal and lender governments cooperate. They deal both with individual projects and with programs of an interdisciplinary nature that generate new structures in the universities. It really has been a pleasure to look through these documents. I have nothing further to add. Of course, a funding approval also implies the commitment to report on the progress and results of a project. Many, a success story has actually hit the headlines. Expeditions into the interior of the Earth. A venture for which scientists at the Geo Institute in Bayreuth have had giant high-pressure presses built. Equipment of this kind is unique in Europe. It can be used to simulate what goes on in the bowels of the Earth and to provide explanations of phenomena relating to the Earth's history that scientists have so far been unable to understand. We are attempting to explore the material properties of the Earth's interior. Drillings give only very limited access to the bowels of the Earth. The maximum depth is around 10 kilometers, while the Earth's radius is 6,370 kilometers. So we have to explore everything else indirectly. Here we examine the material properties of the Earth's matter under the enormous pressures and temperatures of its interior. The Earth is constructed like an onion and consists of different shells. Its 70 kilometer thick crust is as thin as a stamp on a football. The upper mantle lies below it, at a depth of around 400 kilometers. After a transitional zone of 250 kilometers thickness, the lower mantle starts. The outer core, at a depth of 2,900 kilometers, consists of liquid iron, while the inner core comprises solid iron. Preparing to look inside the Earth, tiny rock samples are carefully prepared and packed together in a cubic cell, a kind of oven, which will heat them up to temperatures of up to 2,800 degrees. The cell is put into the high-pressure press, in which pressures of up to 2,600 bars, 100,000 times the pressure of a car tire, are created. These are the conditions that would be found at a depth of around 700 kilometers in the Earth's mantle. The researchers are particularly interested in the way matter is shaped and transformed in the process. In further examinations involving highly sensitive electron microscopes, the little brown crumbs reveal something about their physical and chemical properties, which are typical of the Earth's deeper layers. With an understanding of such processes, the environmental conditions of the past can be reconstructed, enabling predictions on current and future developments such as climate change, volcanic eruptions and earthquakes. The past is the key to the future. Only when we understand what has happened on the Earth and in the Earth over the past billions of years will we be able to extrapolate into the future. In experiments on water exchange between the Earth's surface and its interior, for example, the Bayreuth scientists have found out that, contrary to previous assumptions, the planet's mantle can absorb an enormous amount of water. Under the microscope, the scientists can observe water being built into the crystalline structure of a mineral if it's exposed to the conditions prevailing in the deeper layers of the Earth. This could explain why the sea level has often fluctuated in the past. One special hallmark of the Geo Institute is its international character. There is equipment here which you cannot find anywhere else in the world. 
the expertise of the people who are already here and who are coming constantly to visit are a big part of the attraction. Research does not stop at national boundaries. One of the DFG's principles is to maintain and promote international scientific collaboration. Bilateral relations with 18 European countries, as well as contractual agreements and arrangements with partner organizations of 22 countries outside Europe, have created a dense network of cooperation. North America is and will stay a special magnet and a goal of most of the DFG overseas fellowship holders. The new cooperation with China is worth a special mention. In 1998, in the presence of the DFG heads and their Chinese colleagues, the foundation stone was laid for a Sino-German center for science promotion. Both sides expect a lively exchange of experience, as well as the planning and implementation of joint research projects and the exchange of scientists. After two years under construction, a modern building complex is now available to meet these requirements. If money is spent on something, people want to see the results. The exhibition, The Roots of Europe, covers years of work at a collaborative research center at Trier University. Often, the relation between the science and the public has been a one-way street, the opening up of which depended on the goodwill of science to communicate with society. An exhibition of this kind enables the topic to be addressed. It puts all those participating on a par and can therefore make a greater contribution to reducing tension in this field than many other attempts in what has tended to be a minefield. Eight examples show stages of the development of a European heartland between the Meurs and the Rhine. Starting in the 4th century and concluding in the 19th, the exhibition documents the roots of a common European culture, the way urban development was shaped by the church and the clergy in Trier, the relations between Jews and Christians in Worms in the Middle Ages, speaking and writing beyond frontiers, and how money and loans controlled manufacture and trade, as well as politics and wars. In order to determine a precise rate of exchange, the money changers had to accurately weigh the various coins. These traces of a common Europe do exist, and they are not traces of a lost age but they reach right into the present. And it is certain that contemporary developments in Europe would hardly be conceivable without these common cultural features. What paper manufacture meant in terms of the development of a media landscape in Europe in the 15th and 16th centuries? How rivalry among the major powers in the 17th and 18th centuries led to the establishment of several fortress cities between the Rhine and the Atlantic coast, such as Luxembourg, which were later on to become a bone of contention for the major powers in their battle for hegemony in Europe. How dedicated women developed new models of girls' education in private schools and orders and engaged in education export and how a flourishing regional cloth industry was established between Maastricht, Liège and Aachen. All this shows that a network of people, ideas and goods was the basis for today's Europe. In addition to the financial support of research projects, providing advice to parliaments and governments on scientific issues is a further central task of the DFG. For example, one important field is that of testing substances at the workplace that are harmful to health. A DFG commission publishes an annual up-to-date list of these substances. Genetic research, with the progress it has made and the risks it entails, is gaining increasing significance. Here, the DFG offers its scientific expertise advising the government on principal issues and making recommendations on draft laws.
on its own account, the DFG is currently having its past in the Third Reich examined. Two of its presidents were willing accomplices of Adolf Hitler and a science policy in the service of the Nazis since 1933. Johannes Stark and SS Brigadier Rudolf Menzel, who to a large degree identified with the national orientation of science. In 1933, the DFG was brought into line, just like many other organizations. And then, as times grew even worse and the country was heading for the Second World War, crimes were committed in the name of science, and also on the basis of DFG projects almost all of which are known today, especially in the context of medicine and human genetics. In his book on the history of the DFG, Nutka Hammerstein has pointed out that after 1945, many scientists were able to continue careers they'd started during the Third Reich. In addition to the crimes it describes, this book also demonstrates that history goes on. Several people somehow got appointed again and entered the scientific community. And they engaged in research that was also supported by the DFG. We still know far too little about what happened after the end of the Second World War. But we are going to examine it. The DFG is well prepared for the tasks and the challenges of the 21st century. An international commission has also given its work an excellent appraisal. It is focusing more and more on promoting young scientists. It wants to attract more foreign scientists to Germany. And in its promotion practice, it intends to set more priorities of its own. One goal remains unchanged, however, that of maintaining its autonomy.